Do you think Kitty's getting too fat? Yeah, she is. Well, hefty. Okay, I gotta get that. I think he's okay. Yeah, I don't know, I mean, you know. Kitty, do you think you're getting too fat? Dealing with 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Yesterday was 91. It's 208,645 miles on the odometer. It is February 28th of 2024. And today's screenplay slash film kind of education, I guess you could say that I'm kind of doing it myself, <clears throat> is from uh, Joel and Ethan's uh, Cohen's film, Blood Simple. It's all over YouTube. So they have some interviews that they've been, you know, I guess releasing. I uh, got some of the secrets, and I'm sorry about the Dutch angle, but I'm resting my elbow on the uh, console, I guess, of the vehicle. Uh, <clears throat> so they, it's an interesting uh, thing about Blood Simple is it's a little, it's a little bit of Racerhead story. If you know anything about the story behind Racerhead which David Lynch is my, my favorite director, but they're my second favorite, Ethan and Joel, Joel Cohen. They're probably my second favorite. But um, here's the whole story on it. First of all, it was shot in Texas. Did not know that. I have not seen it. So it's one of their only films, other than some of their new stuff. Uh, I have not seen what just came out either, which is something Runaway Girls or one, Runaway... Uh, I think the original title had the word dykes in it, <clears throat> but I haven't seen that one. I think it's, that one's just Ethan. But um, it was shot in Austin, Texas. Uh, and they had a script. They had really hardly, well, they had no money. So they made a trailer of the film using, I guess, stand-in actors or just actors. I don't know if they were part of the film or if they got them for just the trailer but they made a trailer because they had to find some way to get money because they didn't there was no there was no real like studio movie i mean studio money uh that was given so there was no funding from the studios so they they had to raise the money this is what i've heard this is what i've heard i don't know for sure but what happened was they made a trailer and they they started to sell well they they started to, to kind of schlep it around town like going to different areas of the northeast or whatever like doctors houses neurologists all, all these different type of people that had money that wanted to invest in it and their main one of their main goals or one of the goals was they wanted to make that money back so that they could pay the investors and so that, that way they could make another movie so 
they had to kind of advertise it as a horror film, like that was set in Texas. Where Blood Simple came about, I have not seen the movie, so I do not know where the title came about. Now, there is a rumor that Holly Hunter was suppo supposed to play one of the lead uh, female or love interests, and that's actually not exactly true. She was uh, introduced to the part, but Holly Hunter was doing Crimes of the Heart or something like that on Broadway and then had to work with the, the playwright. She, she actually had worked with a lot of playwrights. I know this because she was part of the uh, Actors Theater in Kentucky Louisville. But this was like her on Broadway, you know, really a, kind of like an important aspect of her career. But she happened to have a roommate, Frances McDormand, who was, was Holly Hunter's roommate, and brought the news to her who she had a boyfriend that was a soap opera actor at the time. So they were already kind of breaking into the industry in a way. And when she showed up to the audition, she kind of told them no. This is kind of an interesting thing because they wanted to see her at two and she had to be on set at the soap opera to see her boyfriend say like two or three lines or something. And they liked the fact that she turned the time on them and didn't just jump at it and like, oh, I want to do it, I want to do it, you know, and like flip out. She wasn't that way at all. She was kind of a little standoffish. So they really liked that about her. That was a kind of an attraction because there's kind of an argument, or not an argument, but kind of a theory in this business, and I've heard this before, that once you really don't want it anymore, that's when they start offering you things. An acorn hit the some some kind of rock or something pelted against the side of the sorry about that. Um because <clears throat> I'm on the I'm on the highway right now while I'm doing this. But anyway, uh so you know, she was not desperate, okay, but she, she was in New York, and she, you know, now it would be a real weird situation because real estate's incredibly high. It's always never been cheap to live in New York, but this was a time in the 80s when word of mouth was everything, you know, there was no social media, there was no social platform, they had no YouTube, so they had to go and get on Broadway and and do the whole thing. And, and, and they were actually looking for Broadway actors. Now, another part of the interview that I switched over that was connected probably to the same filmmakers that made the interview or whatever, the media, YouTubers or whatever, is uh, Ilm Emmett Walsh, who happened to be a theater actor. And I think got into film and it was like a big film actor. I think he like, did like a hundred movies or something like that. But he was well advanced as a, a already a professional actor. And he played one of the main evil villain characters in it. Well, anyway, he got the part and just thought it was just a bunch of BS and did not know what was going on. So they flew him all the way out to Texas, I guess Austin. And they offered him like a $700 check, but he was like, man, I don't know who you guys are. And, and that, you know, I, I used to work at a bank and it is, it is a, a big deal. And in this, in this industry, checks are thrown around and stuff and you never know. And it actually hurts the person that tries to cash it, you know. So he said, no, you know, he, he, he said, no, you, you'll pay me in cash. So the entire time that Ilm, uh, Emmett Walsh is on set, he's got like $700 Chris Beals in his pocket that's paid by the filmmaker. They paid him in cash, which I thought was kind of weird. I guess, you know, Walsh, you know, the actor Emmett Walsh was... You know, he just was trying to get something, you know, and that's, you know, so he just, they just flew him out there and he was actually kind of a real actor. They didn't know how to talk to actors. Um, they, this was all a new experience. So it's probably a good film to watch because they all were learning as they were doing it. Even Francis McDormand, uh, was learning like what to do on set and they didn't have a stand in. So she had to be there while they, they lit everything, you know, and it, they really had like no money to make this movie. But it turned out uh, they, 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 they slung it around uh, L.A. and no studios wanted it. And finally they entered it into the Toronto Film Festival, Blood Simple. And it got, a, it got a pretty positive review. And from there, just like something like Clerks, you know, Clerks, Clerks was uh, Kevin Smith. When he did Clerks, it was, it was kind of like a good movie reviewer liked it. And so from there it took off, you know, like it got a good write-up. And Blood Simple, which is Ethan and Joe Cullen, they actually broke into the business by doing basically this movie, and, and by it all came from like a trailer. So they sold the trailer to people. And it's a good idea, actually. It's a really good idea. I've heard of filmmakers doing this kind of stuff in, in the business. They make like a demo 
or whatever. They show it to the actors, they show it to the producers, and it's kind of like the feel, you know, the feel of the film or whatever. It's a good little story. I'm, I'm planning on seeing Blood Simple because I have not seen it, so I want to watch it. But my favorite comedy is Raised in Arizona, so that it's down as my number one comedy. I, I put that one over Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. And um, I've always liked them since I saw um, playing, well, since I saw uh, Raised in Arizona, I always thought like, you know, who are these people that are like, what, what is this about, you know? I saw it like on like HBO or something a long time ago when it was being aired. And from there, I think, I, I, you know, I was like a big fan before really anybody. So once it's coming March 2nd and then Mary Poppins April 20th. But anyway, I just saw these those interviews. So that, that's not really about screenplay writing. But it kind of is in a way because, you know, maybe you could write a trailer, you know, for, for somebody. Or maybe you could try try starting off by writing a trailer, you know. Uh, it's a good way to kind of tighten up maybe the movie and maybe maybe get something sold. I have an idea, so with Grace, maybe something like this. And I've also kind of come up with some more ideas, more story structure, and also uh, some more character implements. I'm thinking about writing more characters for that. It could, it could maybe be a series. All right, so for today, we're gonna go ahead and zero that out. And yesterday, we did about that amount right there. All right, 604.14, 7.7. So there's a musician called Carter Burwell. Oh, by the way, dinosaurs around the world, January 26th, May 30th, are there now. The robotic dinosaurs are inside that area. But anyway, Carter Burwell, uh, was the musician that was behind the soundtrack uh, to Blood Simple. So he actually scored the movie. So even though it was a very low budget movie, uh, they had a soundtrack. So they, oh, they had a, they had a, a score is what they call it. A musical score, which is, you know, a pretty big deal for a first time movie. Most of them pretty much kind of have it. Sometimes the filmmakers will do the score. But this guy was named Carter Burwell. Pretty good job. No, I'm listening to it right now. It's pretty creepy. And so they did pass it off as kind of a horror film. It kind of it kind of is in a way. It's, it's more, you know, like the Coen brothers are, uh, they use reality to strike the horror, you know. Like Fargo is scary because of the reality, you know. Blood Simple, I haven't seen Blood Simple. I've seen Fargo. I own Fargo, and I, I also own a lot of the other movies. They have kind of like a dark, you know, uh, in a flock of some kind of bird right there. You can't really see them. They have uh, kind of a dark uh, underscore, you know. And, and, you know, and then they pull off this very funny, charming comedy. Here's another one. There they go there. Looks like a thing of geese. Uh, Race in Arizona. It's a very funny, upbeat comedy, you know, so they can do both, you know. They can be very, very dark, or they can just be very, very funny. One of the two. They're very hot or cold. Uh, they're very extreme kind of thing. I thought the Buster uh, one, the one about the Buster Scruggs or whatever, I thought that one was like the best thing that year. I think uh, Zoe Kazan is in it, like the granddaughter of e Elia Kazan. But um, yeah, you know, it's they're they're very they're very. I would say, I can see how they've explored New York. You know, they use like real actors, you know, from like the stage actors and sta and stuff like that. You know, and they've used like you know very Hollywood actors like. Uh, uh, Nicholas Cage, you know, they, they use all different types, you know, but starting off, they, you know, have kind of a rough beginning is what, what, even though they're kind of one of the lead filmmakers, they've started off at the bottom, you know, and then they've worked their way up. They're one of those types, it's just like David, David Lynch kind of did the same, even though it took, David Lynch went from like nobody knowing who he was to Mel Brooks sending him out on assignment for, you know, in England for, for Elephant Man. So he went like way up there really quick. And they worked their way up, you know, so, and they, I think they've won a lot of awards. They've, they've gotten a lot of actors, uh, the Oscar. Um, and I, I personally, I kind of want to go back and maybe put No Country for Old Men on my top 10, maybe. It might make it. I, I don't have a lot of the filmmakers I talk about are not always on my top 10, as in greatest films. And I hope this one's right. This one's going a little bit further. But, um... 
like I don't talk a whole lot about Egmar Bergman, right? I don't talk a whole. I, I do talk a little bit about Scorsese. He's made my top ten, and Spielberg made it made it with Jaws on number. I think it was number eleven. It's really what what it is. It's top eleven. I have a top eleven, and then I have a bunch of spots for number eleven. If it makes it into the eleventh part of my top eleven, and that means it's like it really got my attention on a personal level. That's how most of my films that are on my from one to eleven are films that. I would like enjoy watching it. Like I'm really considering putting Alien, Ridley Scott. I enjoy watching those types of movies and I can watch it over and over and I enjoy watching it each time. Uh, Race in Arizona didn't make the top 11, but it did make my top comedy. So I have a comedy one that I'm making. So if I wanna go somewhere for laughs, you know, I, I can do that and planes, trains, and automobiles and things like that. So I have a, I have a comedy section that I put it in building, you know, like Woody Allen's probably in there and things like that. But when it comes to top films that I like to watch, I don't really talk a lot about those filmmakers a whole lot. Like Coppola's on that, I talk about him a little bit. He's on it with the conversation. So it's a film that I can watch over and over and, I'll, and I still get something new out of it each time. So I'm thinking about maybe adding, whoops. I'm thinking about adding No Country for Old Men. Probably it's gonna make that top 11. Because every time I watch it, I get something new out of it. It seems to be good from point A to point Z. You know, there's no like real flaw in it that, that bothers me. Um, same thing with like films like The Conversation and films like The Seventh Seal, Igmar Bergman, and all these types of film, Wild Strawberries, I think was on my top 11. All these films are kind of like films that I enjoy watching. You know, they, they strike my attention and, I, and they can keep me um, entertained. I don't like films that I can second guess the film or it, 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 it comes off as something that's like manufactured or something, you know, or I don't know what I'm trying to really say, but it's kind of a mystery why films strike a chord, you know, and I have a feeling the Blood Simple might do that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see, see if I can get a hold of it. It might be something, and also it's filmed in Austin, so I might try to see that one and maybe do a little review on it. I do, I do, I do reviews on stuff that I see on, on, on YouTube for free, but not all these really great films are offered uh, at no, at no, at, you know, at no. Another one that made it was uh, Blue Velvet. Blue Velvet did make it on number six, slot number six on my all time top 11. You can see my all top to all time top 11 on my uh, you, uh, Facebook, it's on my Facebook under uh, films. And I think it's under film reviews. If you go and look under film reviews, because I do film reviews, if you look at that, you'll see where the top 11 is located. And then underneath the top 11, I have nothing but honorable mentions. And it goes on for a lot of films, a whole lot of films. And a lot of these filmmakers will, will reoccur on my honorable mention as well. And these are films. And like some of the films I don't always put on there, put on there because I don't really admit that I've seen that film. And there's a few that are, there's some films that have come out in the last maybe 20 years and stuff. People are a little embarrassed about, you know, even admitting that they watched them. You know, some, so, so, some films are just really out there, irreversible. But I'm not going to say that, that I've seen that film, you know, because, you know, like, wow, why would you even want to watch a film like that, you know? But anyway, Blood Simple, I'm going to see if I can check it out. Saw some reviews on it today. Saw some information on it. Looks like it could be a keeper. Uh, it's going to be an Austin location film. So, you know how like uh, Richard Linkletter did uh, he did Slacker. Well, Blood Simple is probably it was shot in Austin. No one's done any filming locations on it so far that I haven't seen. There may be a few, but I haven't I haven't seen anything on it yet. But when it comes to you know media hype about a film, that one's talked about quite a bit. a whole series of houses one after the other one after the other all look almost identical like very similar in structure on the, all on this one hill make like a good like you know maybe still photography or something from afar yeah there they are these are like duplexes I think I don't think they're actual houses
All right, this is a two-parter, 646, seven, 2.6 miles. All right, so I got the uh, umbrella up there because we're dealing with a soft rain right here. So the umbrella's to remind me on that one. And it looks like we're running a little low. Let's go out and stop by some gas station or something. I usually don't think of these things all the time. Um, plus, I don't really always fill up because gas prices are kind of like a roller coaster. Uh, but I have to eventually get these two done and then find a gas station, so. Says, as you knock or something, you have to have a code just to get in. Yeah, there's no way into those places unless they give you the code. That's some kind of code digit to go into the hallway. So you need a special code to get into there just to get inside of it. All right, next one, 714, 16 minutes, 7.3 miles. And we're stretching it today. All right, now I'm gonna have to stop right after this drop. Maybe we'll have to get gas for this drop. And that was a slowdown. The one before it was a slowdown too. What I mean by slowdown was it, it's just meaning there was some kind of issue or you just can't knock on the door or whatever, you know. And the front, I think the other one, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was just, it was also over seven miles. And uh, they were just very slow at getting to the door. You know, I almost had to call them. But it was like something out of a, a recent Aaron Darnofsky movie. You know, Darren Aronofsky is the right pronunciation. Uh, it was like a recent Darren Aronofsky movie. Well, when I, you know, I was making that comment about David Lynch. I mean, every filmmaker out there knows they're not they're not as good as David Lynch. You know, you know, you you would say that, and they'd all agree. You know, they'd all shake their hands. I mean, it, it's a good film, but it's not David Lynch. You know, I mean. That's, <laughs> you know, there's no comparison with his stuff, really. I mean, could you imagine, like, looking, any of the filmmakers today, looking at the script of Eraserhead, they'd be like, what in the world, you know? And they'd be like, what, what was this, in heaven, everything is fine? Like, what, what is, you know, they, they, they would even, like, it, they would even, like, read more than three or four pages of it, you know, without putting it down and going, what the, you know? Of course, none of them are compared to, you know, to David Lynch, and, and when David Lynch was, uh, looks like I got a motorcyclist right here, just kind of sitting there. When, uh, you know, when he was making, um, well, before he was making Eraserhead, he, he, he offered Ronnie Rocket, you know, to a, a studio exec or something, or at least someone that was involved in the industry, because they were all pretty much studio execs at that point. Uh, at least some of them were at least part of the academic side of filmmaking, but they were like, absolutely not, you know, uh, they told him no, you know, but you know, he finally, you know, presented a racer head. It took him five years to do it, but of course, you know, nothing is in comparison to, to Lynch and they all know that he invented, you know, Lynchian. All right. Let, let's just put it this way about David Lynch. When Woody Allen uh, was up for best screenplay right next to Blue Velvet, he was honored 
when he went to the awards to even be, you know, on the same list as David Lynch. The, he is like, to them, something they can't even touch. So, you know, you see a movie and you're like, God, that was a really good movie. Well, it's not David Lynch. That's what you say, you know, I mean, it, it's a good movie, don't get me wrong, but it's not Mulholland Drive or, you know, Wild at Heart or Eraserhead, you know, or any of them, you know, uh, Inland Empire. I mean, you know, you're sitting through that and you're just, you're, you know, you're like the whole entire time. Seven forty eight, five, two point three. Eight sixteen, ten minutes, four point four.